Welcome to The Lounge, where I, Amina Hughes, talk to people in the music, film and other creative industries about the essence of their craft. Today with Natalie Di Napoleon. She's an Australian American singer songwriter and poet who shares her time between Fremantle in Western Australia and Santa Barbara in California. Natalie began her musical career in 96, fronting Perth indie rock band Bloom, and in 99 helped break new ground for Americana music in Australia by forming the alt country ensemble Flavor of the Month. In 2005, Natalie branched out as a solo artist later moving to California to continue life as a recording artist. In 2018, she was awarded the Bruce Dorr National Poetry Prize, and in 2019, Natalie recorded her fourth solo album, You Wanted to Be the Shore, But Instead You Were the Sea. Natalie Di Napoleon, welcome to The Lounge. Thank you. Great to be here. Now, your new album is beautiful. It's acoustic. It's uh, Americana but with piano, a little bit folky, a little bit poppy. You wrote the album on the front porch of your 100-year-old Californian cottage and recorded it in a 100-year-old wooden chapel nestled in the hills behind Santa Barbara. I have so many questions about the recording process, but but first I want to talk a little bit about the songwriting process. Uh, You describe the album as a place where it's okay to be vulnerable and courageous fierce and kind and to stand your ground yet still be forgiving all at the same time. It's quite focused on telling women's stories. Uh, Talk me through some of the material and the inspiration behind it. Um, Well, basically as a songwriter, I normally start out and I do this the same thing with my poetry. I just start letting the ideas flow and come out and I see, I see, I let the ideas tell me where they're leading me. And so I started picking up my guitar and writing songs again when I finished my Master of Arts in Creative Writing. All these songs started flowing out of me. And the first songs I wrote were No Longer Mine, um, Wild Flowers, and what else was first? And second time around. And I sort of those three songs i sat back and i looked at them and i was like well these songs are about women's stories and these songs are telling me that i want to write songs about women's lives and tell women's stories that haven't been told before i feel like there's this whole well of songwriting and ideas that just haven't been touched upon actually thunder rumor was one of the early songs of course thunder rumor no longer mine and second time around and Thunder Rumor was inspired by I had read this statistic many years ago that the most dangerous time in a woman's life if she's in an abusive relationship is when she tries to leave that person and her chance of getting murdered increases I can't remember the exact statistic but it's 20 or 100 fold it's chilling and I just for some reason that just stuck with me and yeah I just really wanted to write a song about that so these three songs came up and then, you know, I journal a lot and I wrote in my journal, I want to tell women's stories that haven't been told before. Everything is better Second time around So I ended up writing Soft, which is about women being soft and not sorry, women being hard and not soft because some of the hardest people I know are women and some of the softest 
gentlest, kindest, most loving people I know are men. Um, I wrote um, reasons about infant and pregnancy loss. Um, you know, I wrote gasoline and liquor for the first, that was the first song I've ever written from a man's point of view. So again, that was kind of pushing things because we're always the muse to men. You know, oh, she's perfect and beautiful. Or, oh, you know, she's terrible and vicious and evil. So like, I wanted to try and sort of fi find this different ground to write songs and Gasoline Liquor was me writing a song from a man's point of view, which I co-wrote with my husband. Again, just doing something different. So each song was an exploration of pushing myself creatively and trying to tell these stories about women. I think there's just a huge wealth of stories that haven't been told that are just waiting to be told. Yeah, you've you've explored uh, the emotional roller coaster of losing an unborn child, uh, childhood trauma, and and its lifelong scars. Uh, as you said, leaving an abusive relationship. Some pretty heavy topics there. Yeah, I've always been like that. I was actually reflecting. Um, the first thing, uh, the first EP I recorded with Flavor of the Month, I wrote a song called Killing Me Twice, and I was inspired by, deeply affected and inspired by this horrific story of a woman who had taken her own life after she had been gang raped. Um, and the song's called Killing Me Twice. And so I've never shied away from writing about difficult topics you know, and look, I love happy music and fluffy music and I listen to lots of stuff, but I love really deep music that digs into places that people don't always dig into. Look, I'm a writer and I feel like songwriting maybe hasn't explored as deeply as it can different topics. So I, I'm willing to, you know, go and blaze across the ground that hasn't been explored before and write about really difficult topics it's a challenge because you don't want to depress people too much mm -hmm. but like telling untold stories to me it's just this gold mine it's just this fantastic gold mine that, that's just waiting to be explored and dug deeper into yeah I relate to that a lot actually I've um I've often had people ask me you know can't you write a happy song and I, my response is always, well, I don't need to write when I'm happy. I, I, yeah. sort of, I, I tend to dig into a lot of the deeper issues as well um, after, quite similarly, after Eurydice Dixon was murdered in Melbourne, um, I was invited to a vigil here in WA and I was okay. so upset. I didn't go. I stayed home and I wrote a song about it because I was just imagining, you know, um, what are we, I just thought, what are we supposed to tell our little girls, you know, in the, in the world with all the threats of um, violence, not just outside of the home, but domestic violence in relationships. I too had been looking into those statistics and, and, you know, I mean, when you look into the stats on, on DV, it's, I mean, how do you ever date again? You know, in some ways it's, it's quite, oh. um, it's re it is really chilling and confronting. Yeah. And, and I just thought, you know, I, I imagined a, a woman putting um, her little girls to bed, and I th and I thought, what would you, what do you tell them? And I wrote a song called "Hey Little Darlings," and mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's and I mean, I cried a lot when I wrote it, like I do when I, I think my best songs are written. Um, if I don't cry when I'm writing a song, I think it's probably not a great song. But I relate completely to what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, and wow. Chris Stapleton said something recently. I've been. Uh, listening to a lot of Chris Stapleton, I've recently fallen in love with his new album and song starting over. And he said something like, like make people more depressed by hearing about them, but showing them a way through yeah. the difficult yeah. things. And, and that's what I hope to do through my music is show people a way through. And as you said, you know, you read these stories. They're not all my stories or things that have happened to me. You know, we're artists, we're empathetic people. We see things that happen to others and we, we need to process those things too. And music and songwriting is a way for me to process my own experience as well as the collective experience and the, you know, stories I hear about. Yeah, I think so too. Artists. Yeah, one of my earliest, um, you know, sort of experiences with songwriting. I'd written about fifty songs, and then I went to, um, I went to an Annie DeFranco concert, 
and I and she's so tiny and she was up on stage and she was um, you know, singing these raw emotive songs, just being completely honest. And I went home and I threw 49 of my songs in the bin and I started again. And it was such a transformative moment for me as a songwriter. I just completely started again. And, um, and then I sort of, I was, you know, I was worried when I, uh, you know, like, like you were saying about being depressing to people or pulling people down when you get up and, and do that and be honest on stage. And, um, and the opposite happened. I, I became like what Annie DeFranco had done for me. Um, I became that for other people based on, you know, the feedback yeah. because it was, it's the thing of an audience member looking at you going, wow, she survived that. And she's up there singing about it. Um, you know, she's so strong. That's inspiring. And they actually go home feeling inspired and like, well, if she got through that, I can get through that too. And that's, yeah. I think, yeah. Absolutely. I, and I don't know if people realise how much courage it takes to actually write those truthful songs. Um, I remember the first time I did and I was just terrified to perform it. But on the flip side of being terrified is this absolute high from being able to express your feelings and connect with people through that. And, like, um, on the album, probably the most difficult song to write was Broken, which is the last song. And I have um, a lot of friends dealing with mental health issues. I've lost a lot of people I love to suicide. And I wanted to write a song about that again, you know, but in a, in a way that, that walks through that difficulty. And yeah, so, and Broken was the last song we recorded when we did the live recording and we did three or four live takes of it and it was like 8 p.m. on a Sunday night and we'd been recording all weekend and I think I literally just fell to the floor in mm. the chapel and I just, I said to Jim, I was like, I don't think I have another take in me. I'm, <laughs> I'm spent. i got nothing left. You know, and that's what we, I just want people to know how much we give as songwriters. Like now I think of what I do as every song I write, sing or perform is a gift I'm giving to the world. You know, here's my gift to you. I, I, I love you. I love humanity. I want humanity to be better. I want us all to do better. I want us all to just be able to process and live and exist through this difficult thing we call life in the best way we can. And, you know, here's my attempt to, to help us all process this and live yeah. through it. Absolutely. Now, speaking of the recording process, you decided to record this album using a single microphone in the old chapel uh, mm -hmm. in Santa Barbara. I've got some questions for the for the technophiles out there. Um, I'm, I'm, <laughs> so, <try> my best. <laughs> I'm so curious about uh, the logistics of recording around one microphone. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just run a gamut of questions at you. I'll just fire some questions and you can just answer what you can. Um, sure. I, I'm thinking how were the bands spaced? Uh, how was the piano picked up? Uh, mm -hmm. Were you doing a layered vocal on top of instrumental recordings or singing live with the band? What kind of microphone did you use? Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I'll get to maybe some questions about the mixing process um, if you were if you were part of that as well. Yeah, great. Uh, were you literally spaced out around one microphone? Yes, literally. So um, what we used was a, a Royer SF24 ribbon microphone. And um, Jim had done this before. Um, Jim Connolly is, was the co-producer and he's an upright bass player. And um, he had recorded in the chapel before with a string quartet. He'd done a couple of albums that way and he'd done it live with the ribbon mic. So yeah, so what we did was you have the ribbon mic, the Royer SF24 sitting in the middle of the room. And I probably stood about a metre away from the mic. And then the other guys were, you know, somewhere between five to 10 metres distance. And depending on what instruments we were playing, we had to move everything. We had to do a little, you know, one minute take. Jim had to listen on the headphones you know, move people backwards or forwards. So we're hitting the right spot with the mic. Um, yeah, the piano was on wheels, so we could like move the piano around. Um, 
yeah, and that's what we did. Um, very 70s even the ribbon microphone is straight out of the 60s 70s to use that um, so it sounds like he was sort of pretty much live mixing you because of uh, you know with with mixing part of it is about I suppose most of what he would have been doing was EQing uh, and getting the balance right but the the spatial awareness was kind of done in the room so he wouldn't have needed yes. to worry about panning or every, everything that was all taken care of during the yeah. recording process and the great thing is that Dan Phillips, the piano player and percussionist, he's also a recording engineer. So I had these two great ears. You know, I'm not a recording engineer. I've always just, I love focusing on songwriting and all the nitty gritty of that. But as far as like all the technical stuff, it's just not something I'm interested in or, you know, want to dive deep into. So between Dan and Jim listening and we had Jesse Rhodes who, uh, we did post-production with, he, he came in on the first day for a few hours and just, just checked, you know, the sounds were okay too. But, you know, mainly it was Jim's thing because he had done that before. So he knew what he was doing. And then um, you had that question about, you know, how did we do it? Is that entire album live or did we do some instrumental takes? So as you know, because you're a singer as well, um, we, I like to play off the mic a lot. I like to do a lot of breathy singing and mm -hmm. I open up my voice and do a lot of like big notes as well. And particularly on this album, um, I had changed my singing and I was singing a lot more dynamically, especially on that, that title track, you wanted to be the shore, but instead you were the sea. So Jim wanted to record the whole album live. And then I just sort of knew cause some of the vocals were really touchy like the thing with the ribbon mic is I didn't have headphones on while I was recording. We all recorded without headphones. So I couldn't tell if I was like per per or blowing out the mic or anything like that. So as it turned out in the end, we got six tracks are the entire live tracks, which we added a scattering of you know, instrumental um, backing vocals and some, you know, uh, percussion touches later. And the other six tracks we ended up, um, we did instrumental takes of everything and we used the instrumental takes and I went in the studio later and overdubbed the vocals and and, in, and it ended up being the songs I thought, like you wanted to be the shore where the vocals are really touchy and, um, you know, there was a lot of close miking and a lot of pulling back and opening up my voice and that, that was just harder to do with the ribbon and, and without, you know, having the headphones on to hear what I was doing to the mic as I played. So... Yeah, so it was a really interesting combination of, you know, um, getting that live, beautiful, magical vibe, the room ambience, the room reverb, and then, you know, also being able to overdub later and, um, you know, finesse things as well. Yeah, I like getting quite intimate with a microphone myself, so I, I can appreciate that. I'd probably want to do every single one. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, do my I'm, – I'm, I've never uh, recorded live with a band always. I, I, do, I have recorded live with a band uh, where I'm separated from them and I'm giving them a um, – what's it called? Guide Brain vocal. Bug. Yes, thank you. A guide vocal, um, but I always, um, yeah, re-record my my final vocal separately. Um, but yeah, it sounds it sounds fun. How how long then did the was the entire recording process? Because it sounds like it wouldn't have taken that long. So we did. Um, I think it was three days. We did one weekend, and then there are a couple of songs, two or three songs we didn't nail. We listen back, and and so yeah, we did three days three weekends for like all the beds and then probably spent about somewhere between four to six weeks. You know, I had a full-time job when I was there um, after work um, doing the, the vocal overdubs, little, little um, percussion touches, some backing vocals and yeah, adding a few little extra instruments and things like that. So three days initially and then some overdubs kind of hard to quantify because um, it was very spread out. But, yeah, but it sounds like a pretty swift uh, method of recording, which is awesome. 
It was. That was nice. And and like I said, you're always trying to push yourself creatively as a songwriter. And this was sort of um, when I recorded Leaving Me Dry with David Pilch, who worked with Katie Lang for so long. I said to him, oh, I, you know, I wish I had a bigger budget. There's all this stuff I wanted to do and add to Leaving Me Dry. And, and David Pilch said, well, limitation creates form, Natalie. And I was like, oh, who said that? And he said, oh, and he actually said, told me who said it, it was Krishnamurti or something. And sure enough, I looked it up. And basically, ever since then, that's almost been my mantra. Limitation creates form. And so we had this limitation. I was leaving America. I got a place in a PhD in creative writing. We knew we were leaving in July. And um, I'd been playing these songs with my band for three or four years. And I knew if I didn't get a record of these songs before we left America, you know, I would lose all this beautiful work we'd done and these great arrangements we'd worked out. So, you know, in March in 2019, that's we went in and <laughs> I just figured, you know, let's just try and do this and, and see what happens. So yeah, the limitation of time created this beautiful form of this magical album with this gorgeous 60s sound because those ribbon mics were what has been used from the 30s to the 60s and 70s to record music. Mm-hmm. And what they say about ribbon mics is they capture acoustic instruments in the most real sounding way to the human ear. So in the 80s, people moved to condenser mics because of digital technology and the condensers were were picking up more of the um, audio range and they could could do a bit more. And and so people went nuts on all the condensers, but a lot of people started saying it's lost the warmth and recordings have lost the sound of their warmth. So, you know, people are noticing this recording sounds warmer. That's why it's because of the ribbon mic. Mm. I used a ribbon mic for one track on my album uh, that I put out a couple of years ago. Um, I did a cover of Joni Mitchell's Woodstock and we had all these different microphones lined up. We had Neumann's and um, a a whole bunch of different uh, mics. I actually recorded most of my final vocals on a Rode K2, which really suits the frequencies in my voice. Mm. Um, But then we had this ribbon mic and it just really suited that song the most, which was funny because it's from that era. Um, Yeah, and it's the only track on the album that we used Mm -hmm. it for, but it really works, just works the best for that song. Yeah, I love playing with mics and vocals. And, yeah, my voice tends to really like Neumann's for Mm. whatever reason. It, It just really loves them. Um, but yeah, there's nothing more fun than just trying different mics for different songs. And yeah, I just, I love doing that stuff. Now your, your poem, First Blood, Assistina, won the Bruce Dorr National Poetry Prize in 2018. I'm just going to read the final stanza. Mm-hmm. She came to see a stitch in time, could not repair the stain of first blood. Spider orchids are too delicate to touch and nothing can hold a match to a bleeding girl. The first time I read this poem, it gave me goosebumps. It gave me chills all over my body. It's it's an absolutely fantastic poem. And if anyone uh, wants to go look it up, it's called First Blood, A Sestina. Um, I came to songwriting through poetry myself. I studied poetry as part of my degree, and I teach the use of poetic techniques in songwriting. So my songwriting is very much influenced by poetry. How do your roots in poetry affect your songwriting? Oh, my goodness. They're so intertwined. It's really difficult. (laughs) It's really difficult to know the difference. Yeah, Yeah. I've been writing. I started writing on my bedside table when I was 10 and I had a little notebook and it would help me get to sleep. And around the same time, my parents bought me my first guitar and I started started playing guitar and writing songs as soon as I could make a noise with a few notes. Um, For me, um, I say if people want to know the difference, for me, in a poem, I can say five or ten different things. 
and I can weave those five or ten different things sort of around each other and I, and I can make the language really complex and put in lots of word plays and stuff like that. But when you're writing a song, you're always trying to aim for a universal note and, and something that hits people the first time. So a song's a little different. You're trying to be a bit more immediate. But given that and saying that, I grew up falling in love with indie rock. So R.E.M., The Breeders, you know, all those, The Pixies, all those kinds of bands, and they all had really wacky lyrics. Mm -hmm. um, maybe in a way that influenced me in my poetry as well. Um, I always thought my song Slow Burn was my attempt at really writing a very poetic um, folk song. So, yeah, that's kind of, I don't know, it's difficult to say. There's only a couple of songs where I've written a poem and then turned them into a song. Um, Cut Your Hair is one of those. I, I had this poem called When You Need to Start Again. So when you need to start again, cut your hair, shave it off, paint it black, dye it red was the first lines of the poem. And then the poem went off into all these things using metaphors about bees and flowers and, you know, as you can do with poetry, right? Mm. Um, but for some reason, though, when you want to start again, shave it off, dye it black, you know, dye it blonde, cut your hair off, all of that sort of, it was like, oh, that's a song lyric, that's a song lyric. And if you find the poem online, the poem's called When You Need to Start Again and it's been published. And then if you go and listen to Cut Your Hair, it's probably a good example of how here's poetry doing one thing, a little bit more complexity with language and wordplay, adding, you know, three or four different metaphors and images and ideas it's playing with. And here's a song, and it, the song's really just playing with one idea. When you break up with someone and they break your heart, you want to start afresh, so you cut your hair. You know, so that's, to me, how you see the difference between poetry and songwriting, but then you can also see how those two worlds sort of mesh together if you look at the, the poem and the song. That's great. It has a great rhythm to it that, that it feels like it does lend itself to song. Um, I actually have a module in my songwriting course that I run that's called Poetry to Song where I try mm -hmm. to show people a poem and how it gets transformed into a song but I've only got examples of my own work because I didn't know of any other examples. Uh, whereas uh -huh. for my other modules, I use lots of other artists, but um, you've just given me an example. So I might be referring to your, <laughs> to that example in the future. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, that would be wonderful. And that was really funny because I went for a walk one day. It was one of those, I come up with lots of really great ideas walking and I've actually done a bit of research and quite a few other artists do that as well. When they get stuck or in a funk, they go for a walk. Mm. And yeah, Cut Your Hair came to me when I went for a walk. I actually, it was one of those things I voice recorded into my phone. Yeah, for me, it's driving. It's long drives, but also walking on the beach um, at sunset. So if anyone's, mm -hmm. um, if anyone's listening on any um, dating apps, I like long walks on the beach at sunset. I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, um, have, you, have you ever missed a turn off on the freeway? I missed a turn off on the freeway <laughs> once because I was writing a song in my head while I was driving. Well, I nuts. I have gotten lost quite a bit while driving and the funny thing is I don't worry about it unless I was, you know, had to be somewhere and I was running late. But um, I generally don't worry about that kind of thing when I am driving if I get lost and I meander or sometimes I take the long way or take the coastal route or whatever because I do, I have no music on in the car, I just have my quiet time and I have written a lot of songs oh. while I'm driving. Yeah. And in fact, awesome. I wrote, I've, I've driven across the Nullarbor Plain three times across Australia, which for anyone who doesn't know, takes six days if you decide to sleep, which you should. It's a good <laughs> idea. Um, it's a good idea to get some sleep. But um, I've, I wrote, you know, a bunch of songs um, driving across across the country. Um, it's just really good. Yeah. Quiet time. I don't know. Even there's something about the rhythm of the car at times. Mm. Um, yeah. Good place to, to write and sing. Yeah, driving and road trips have given me so many ideas. In fact, gasoline and liquor came from a road trip because um, my mm -hmm. husband and I like to go out and travel through the deserts of America a fair bit. He's a photographer, so he's always got some photography project he's doing. And one time we were going out to Joshua Tree. We love the high desert and the Joshua Tree Desert and the Mojave Desert. 
and we drove past a store and the sign on the store said gasoline and liquor. And I just turned to Brett and I said, that's a song. And he like looks at me, he's like, yeah, <laughs> all right, whatever. And I was like, no, that's a song. It was like, you know, when you see a sign, it was like a sign. I said to him, no, that's a song. And then I said, oh, but I don't think I can write that because gasoline and liquor is a man's song. And then we kept driving and then I said, you've got to help me write it. And so I hung on to this idea and when we got home from the road trip, I emailed him one day at work and I said, so you're going to send me those lyrics? <laughs> <laughs> and two days later, he sent me like a rough draft of lyrics for gasoline and liquor. And he had this line in there like, and he was smoking a cigar in his polyester suit. And I just said, no, 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 no. No, Breddy. I was just like, there's no way I'm going to sing he was smoking a cigar in his polyester suit. I said, look, Nick Cave can pull that off. Just try and remember who I am and what I can sing. And um, yeah, I emailed him back and I said, nah, nah, nah. You gotta, I just said, it's a song lyric. Think about what's singable. And actually, this is what showed me maybe sometimes the difference between, you know, poetry and lyrics is, is you have to, you know how we hold on to notes and and you know, things can't have too many k k g g sounds in them and you know, too many consonant sounds in them. So anyway, he came back with this second set of lyrics and, and, and the song ended up being a real genuine co-write because he wrote the chorus, you know, gasoline and liquor. One came on fast, the other acted slow, gasoline and liquor. One helped me stay, one made me stay, the other helped you go. And yeah, and half the verses were his his lyric and the other half I sort of came up with. So it was it was really fun to do that and get inside a man's head and write from that point of view. Because when you really think about it, not many women write songs from men's point of views. Because I think honestly, we're not that arrogant. When yeah, we just gonna... don't have that, no, but we don't go, well, I know what men think. I'm glad you said it. I was trying not to say it. But even for me, I didn't go, I know what men think. I asked my husband to co-write this song with me. Because I'm like, oh, I, I want to know more about what men think and how they think. And, you know, so whereas men always, there's always this assumption of how we think and feel. And there's lots of songs men have written from women's points of view. And, and so, again, that was another thing where I was like, OK, how many songs do women write from men's point of view? You know, it was really fun. It was really fun to explore that. And again, being an empathetic songwriter and human being, you know, putting aside anything, you know, trying to be a feminist or whatever else, it's just a lovely experience to try and do as a human to put yourself in someone else's shoes for a moment. Yeah, absolutely. The um, the sign that you saw, uh, it reminds me of a, a, a place I saw in Nashville once or just on the outskirts of Nashville, there was this huge shop. Um, there's a shop that sells uh, alcohol, tobacco, um fireworks and wedding dresses <laughs> <laughs> which is so perfect um oh That's firearms wrong. as well so yep alcohol tobacco firearms and wedding dresses so it's all you need for your perfect uh shotgun wedding so i just thought that was fantastic <laughs> that's there's a song in that i hope you're gonna write that one <laughs> maybe i'll have to <laughs> Uh, speaking of, of your songwriting process, because you're talking a lot there about writing, that's co-writing that song with your husband, do you mostly write alone and then work with others on arrangements or is songwriting a collaborative process for you in general? Um, in the past, I had um, first couple of songs I wrote with Grant Furstat when we were in Flavour of the Month, we co-wrote them. Like he came up with the guitar and, and I came up with the lyric part, with the vocal part. And um, then I sort of only needed those two songs. And once we'd written those two together, I just took off and just started writing on my own mostly and would take things to him sometimes. We'd, he'd change maybe a chord or two, but not really very much. And then um, I was very protective of my songwriting really. So for many years, it was really just me. I didn't take many suggestions from other people and, and um you know, David Pilch and I, we worked on maybe one song on Leaving Me Dry where he changed the arrangements for the birds and the trees, which I ended up being really happy with. 
And I think later when I thought about that more, I thought, yeah, I want to, again, you know, I've been writing songs on my own for so long, these confessionals, singer-songwriter, really personal songs. Let's try and do something different. And so I emailed a whole bunch of friends in Santa Barbara and I said, do you want to try and co-write with me? And I had a session with Jim, a session with Dan, and I, asked, I actually asked about 10 people and only two or three people got back to me. And I didn't end up co-writing with people, but in the process of sitting down and playing with them, I actually came up with different ideas and they gave me maybe different chords or, you know, oh, maybe you could try this for the middle eight and, you know, just sort of different arrangement ideas working with other people. And then yeah. part of that process um, was... I, again, because I was wanting to try and do something different, my husband bought me a songwriting session with um, Marty Wilson Piper of the church, a Skype songwriting session. And that was really great because he just told me, you know, he suggested, again, it wasn't really more songwriting. It was more the arrangement of my songs. You know, why don't you pause here, diamonds and pause, diamonds and pause, rather than like just strumming your way through. So he gave me some more suggestions for dynamics in my song. So that sort of notched everything up a bit. And then I went and did a songwriting workshop with Eliza Gilkerson, Mary Gaucher and Gretchen Peters. And between the, these three women, they all have a bunch of Grammy Awards. Gretchen Peters has had songs recorded by Brian Adams. Mary Gaucher's had Blake Shelton record her song, I Drink, and a whole bunch of other country artists record stuff. Eliza Gilkerson's won... Grammy Awards and been doing the folk circuit for years. And I went to this songwriting workshop with sort of half, probably about half the songs on the album and, you know, rough drafts of songs. And I took Thunder Rumour there because I'd really been trying to tell this other woman's story and get this song right. And I was really struggling. And I played Thunder Rumour to the group and to Mary Gaucher and Mary goes, there's something's not, he goes, she goes, the song's good. There's something in there, but you're not being personal enough. You're not writing personal enough. Why are you holding back? What are you holding back? And she kept questioning me and I just broke down. Was this, um, the, was this the songwriting session in Taos in New Mexico? Yeah. 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 I just broke down, started crying and it wasn't really, it wasn't any, well, it kind of was what she said. It was what she said, which was to be more personal. And I felt like that's all I had done for so many years and nobody cared. I was like, I poured my heart out. I ripped my heart open on stage of like, you know, as you said, you know, being vulnerable, written these really truthful songs, trying to write songs about difficult things. I felt like, you know, a lot of people weren't writing about and that it hadn't got through to people when I was finally trying to do something different and someone's telling me, no, you've got to write personal songs again. And I was just so burnt just by the whole thing. I just broke down and like that night I broke down more and the coyotes were howling outside our room in Taos and I was crying and I, I don't know, I think I may have been as loud as the coyotes that night. But like I got to the, the end of my sorrow and I just sort of, sort of went, well, you know what? I've been writing songs for 25 years and I'm not about to stop now. I haven't given up a quarter of a century of my life to songwriting to just give up. And I just decided to pick myself up and go back to the workshop and, you know, dust off my skirt and my cowboy boots and I went back there and the next day um, they gave us an exercise and I wrote um, Mother of Exiles. Mother of exiles, can you hold me? Pull me to your breast like a newborn baby. Eliza Gilkerson helped me finish Broken and Mary pushing me on Thunder Room and made me realise, okay, the song's good. You know, Mary Gaucher has told me the song's good, so I need to put more work into this. I need to, so what I took away from what Mary said was I needed to dig deeper into her personal story about, you know, her leave, trying to leave this abusive relationship and break free. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I went back and, and that song must have gone through about 20 different drafts to get to where it did. 
Uh, yeah. Well, you've, you've um, come up with a, a wonderful album experience for people now. Um, you, you launched the album here in Australia, in Perth, with a local uh, group of musicians. What's next for you? Um, just looking at trying to do some regional shows and, and see if we can tour early next year tossing up ideas of doing some sort of special live stream event where we pick a nice venue and maybe live stream me playing with the great band that I pulled together at the Duke of George of Dave Brewer and Kathy Oliveri and Ben Franz and, and Andy Pearson. And yeah, doing something like that would be great. So yeah, just, just pushing forward and trying to get these songs out to the world. Awesome. Well, the brand new album, You Wanted to Be the Short, but instead you were the C, is available now on Spotify, Apple Music, Bandcamp, YouTube, wherever you find your music. Natalie Di Napoleon, thank you so much for joining me on The Lounge. Thanks for having me, Amina. It's been a wonderful experience. Yay, for me too. <laughs> I'll talk to you soon. Awesome. The Lounge is brought to you by Sky Woman Productions in Australia. Produced by Travis Curry at Curry Media in Canada. Subscribe on YouTube, Twitch, or wherever you find your podcasts. And watch us live via the Amina Hughes pages on Facebook or Twitter. I would like to extend a big thank you to my very special guests and to all of you beautiful people for watching or listening. Thank you for joining me on The Lounge.